Learning a movement practice can actually be quite a demanding and scary thing and a lot of the time is spent failing and trying things over and over again. You have to learn where your limbs are in space, you have to learn what muscles to engage and often you have to learn a whole dictionary of terms and names for each specific movement. But my goal today is to help you speed up that process and to help you learn in a much more intentional and productive way. So I've gone all out and I've created a framework to help you learn to move faster. But I don't mean moving faster like running, although this technically could help with that. I mean learning movements in a faster and more efficient way. For example, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu moves, yoga, weightlifting, and a bunch of other sport or exercise practices. This framework was developed from everything I know as a yoga teacher, a fitness teacher, as well as what I'm learning as a master's psychology student, and it has science-backed data and includes an interview with one of my amazing friends. This friend is a learning scientist who works with embodied movement. I can't think of anyone more perfect to interview than her for this question. I also will attach a PDF at the end of this so you can get a better grasp on the subject. All right, let's dive in. So what do I actually mean by learning to move? We can distill it as learning the skills required to be proficient at a certain movement or an overall movement practice. We can apply this framework to individual skills like weightlifting or an armbar, and then we can scale it up to apply it to all other relevant aspects or skills like the fundamental lifts so that you become proficient in overall lifting or fighting with proper form. So the framework revolves around somewhat fluid stages. There's a general direction, but you often bounce around throughout the different stages. Keeping that in mind, let's jump into stage one, preparation and exploration. Warning, you'll definitely need to revisit this stage many times when you're gathering information for new skills. So within this stage, we actually have two phases. First one is the experimental phase. So if you don't actually have a movement practice in mind for this framework, then this is the phase that is important. In this phase, you want to try a bunch of different things, watch videos on different sports that interest you, try sports that you never thought interest you in the first place. You might find that there's something you're super passionate about. Go to a bunch of different classes, yoga classes, tennis, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Just try a bunch of things and see what is interesting to you, what sparks a little bit of passion. The goal here is to pick something you really enjoy because if you actually have intrinsic motivation then it'll be so much easier to keep learning and get through the difficult learning stages of that chosen movement practice. Also bonus if your entry point is not too difficult so we're not jumping straight into backflips after not having done a movement practice in a long time. For example with weightlifting you can choose dumbbells before you go into barbells. You can slowly work your way up and there's very little to discourage you. Next up we have the information acquiring phase. Once you've chosen something, we can start gathering information. During this phase though, we need to figure out where we can get the right information, making sure it's high quality and that we're receiving the information with the right mindset. Importantly, we need to avoid picking information based off of appearances alone. Choosing information based on appearances can be a slippery slope and can often leave you feeling frustrated or unmotivated. That's because people's bodies react differently to exercise and will never look the same as somebody else's. Because of this, there can be many knock-on effects, even crushing your motivation you had initially for the sport. There is actually a whole marketing technique based off of this, so just be aware of that, that we see a result and we purchase emotionally because we want that kind of result. I'm also mainly talking about social media and while there is good information on there, it can also be a little bit difficult to understand which is a reputable source or not, including me. <laughs> I might come back on here in a couple years and be like, oops guys, I was wrong, okay? Science and everything is always changing. However, don't let this freeze you. It's better to take action. And if you have a good coach, it's kind of their job to do the background research and scientific research on all the different movements, etc. On the other hand, social media actually can be a really good place for inspiration, for workout. Just be aware. Okay, so now that we've picked a couple pieces of information or moves or skills we want to practice, how do we actually study it? Well, first, we don't want to pick too many things at a time. So pick about three or four key movements. So the big three or four positions that you notice happening all the time within your sport. For weightlifting, that could be the squat, the deadlift, the row, the bench press. And I know for yoga, it's downward dog, cobra, mountain pose, the lunge or warrior one. Anything you see repetitively and you feel like needs immediate attention that you've discovered in the last two phases. 
Once you've picked your skill and you've made some maybe written notes or mental notes, it's time to put it into action. Okay, stage two, learning to learn. But before we properly dive into the tips, I think it's really important to understand our body's role in learning. And for this, I went to interview my good friend, Julia. And I still can't believe I have a friend which works on such a cool topic. Julia is a math learning and embodiment researcher working on studying embodiment via VR. So just briefly let me explain what embodied cognition is because it's an integral part of her research. Embodied cognition is the integration of sensory motor and bodily experiences in shaping our cognitive processes and understanding. So it's how our bodily motions and our experiences shape how we think, how we process and how we understand things. Which for someone like me interested in both psychology and the body, this is like the coolest subject ever. It's like a meshing of the two. So from Julia's life experience and research, she has some amazing nuggets of information to share with us. There are two ways actually that the body is involved in learning. So the first thing is like the spontaneous part of it. So if you're trying to make sense of something, if you're communicating with someone, you're actually moving your body spontaneously. You try to make sense of something new, you're gonna do some kinds of gestures to try to represent things in space. Mm -hmm. And this happens spontaneously without you like effectively trying to say, okay, I'm gonna do this, this and that. When you go in school and things like this, very often you are asked to sit like not moving on your desk and it's kind of censoring this natural thing that we do. So contrary to belief, sitting still while we're trying to learn, which is what most of us have been doing for a lot of our school years, can actually hinder our learning. So learning sports naturally involves quite a lot of movement. So we actually have a little bit of a head start when learning different movement activity because we see it visually and then we put it directly to action where we're using both our mind and our body. So we're learning and studying and then applying it pretty much instantly. Sometimes the movements, you do them because of a certain activity. So let's say you're in virtual reality and manipulating and you are moving as well, right? But it's not spontaneous. You're doing it to interact with something. Mm -hmm. And you also learn through this. So it's called directed like bodily actions. It's because it doesn't come spontaneously. It comes because the activity asks of you to move. And through observing what you are doing, etc., you can actually uh, learn a bit better. So spontaneous movement is also really important. And get this, this was absolutely crazy when I first heard it. Reduce your cognitive load. So instead of like yeah. keeping 1000 things in your mind, you have some on your, on your body, be it like numbers or angles. Like, yeah, this was here. Let me look at that. That's parallel. Ah, okay, so this is different, you know? And uh, that's very important to use your body here to, you know, <laughs> make some space in your mind for different processing steps. And that's why if I ask you to solve any problem, like one thing you will do as soon as it becomes too complicated is like you're gonna take some paper and you're gonna draw you know, random stuff, not even like proper mathematical symbols, but you're going to start like to represent things and connect them Yeah. because you need to offload some of this. So, you huh. know, we offload information from our mind on to our body, which reduces the mental load of learning and puts it on your body. That's, that's just crazy. So again, don't censor your movements if something naturally comes up while you're learning. For example, if your coach is trying to teach you a deadlift, it's okay to try and do the movement, your own body weight alongside them or watch them first and then do it the second time. So don't try and freeze your body. Just let any natural movements appear. That also can help your coach kind of direct where maybe you're missing something. We can understand whether a learner understands the concept by how they move. Mm. And sometimes we have situations where people move properly, but what they say is wrong. So you have like, ah oh yeah, the slope decreases and the hand is going correctly, but oh. the voice is not going correctly. Mm. And the first evidence of learning is through the body before we can consciously like put words on it or like uh, start writing it down and these kinds of things. As teachers, we can understand when a student grasps a concept by looking at how they're moving. Like in yoga, you can often see if a student grasps the pose by how they're entering the pose, how they're holding the pose, what muscles they're using and their overall alignment. But just keep in mind, some people take longer at this than others and that's completely okay. Everyone's in a different place when it comes to understanding how their body moves, etc. It's actually more useful to give vague metaphors than actually precise instruction. Mm -hmm. So if I tell you like, put your toe here and put your elbow here, da, 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 it doesn't help you. If I say like, imagine you have like roots 
grounding you to the floor and suddenly you have a very strong stance. So finally using vague cues like you often hear in yoga, which yoga is very stereotyped for, can help us learn. So if you imagine you're a tree drawing up energy from the earth or if you're in sphinx pose and you're pulling yourself towards a cookie, those kinds of things automatically elicit a kind of movement in our body. Those kind of things help students grasp the concepts and helps them visualize and implement the proper sensations and techniques. So next up we have the proper learning techniques and tips. I've compiled a list of tips and information both from Julia and from my own experience. However, you don't need to implement all of these techniques, even adding in just a few can help your learning loads. Okay, first up we have deliberate practice. Focus on actually putting effort into your learning. Be specific on what skill you want to practice or drill on a specific day. A good example of this is looking up a video on deadlifts and then trying the different variations the next day in the gym. Or something specific that I do is I practice my handstands on lower body days. That way my upper body still has energy, but I'm able to work my lower body at the same time. If I did handstands while I did an upper body day at the gym, then my handstands and form would be much worse. Next up we have chunking. So when I interviewed Julia, I asked her what the concept of like clicking understanding something suddenly and she mentioned the concept of chunking one is what we call chunking is when like a series of many steps suddenly becomes one step and you can do it much faster without it taking so much space in your working memory chunking is initially splitting up concepts into single chunks or parts eventually all those single parts cascade into one she gave the example of when you're young, you begin by counting on your fingers. But then as you get better at it, you don't need your fingers anymore and it becomes just very simple. It becomes a simulation of counting in your head. Next up, Julia mentioned congruent gestures. And congruent gestures are basically gestures which match the presentation of the thing you're trying to learn, the thing or the movement you're trying to learn. She mentioned a study where dancers began by learning the choreography just with their fingers. And that way, when they were able to go into the movement and practice it with their entire body, they already had increased understanding, engagement, and memory retention of the dance itself. Next up, we have differential exposure. So this is key. We should try and learn these skills in multiple or different contexts. For example, reading, watching a video, performing the movement, or teaching it to someone else. Although if you're teaching it to someone else, they may have a different body, so a slightly different presentation of the movement. Next up, we have interleaving. This technique involves mixing up different topics or forms of practice. Rather than focusing on one topic in a single study session, it is more beneficial to mix up multiple different topics. Interleaving helps improving problem solving skills and applying the information in different contexts. So bringing back the example of doing handstands on lower body days, that's a way to mix in two different topics. Next up, we have spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is pretty much given in the name, but it is increasing the intervals between repeating the subject or skill over time. This spaced repetition is much better than repeating the same skill in masses at the same time. We can do this in quite a relaxed way when it comes to working out because if you're going to a gym or a class on different days of the week, then that's automatically spaced repetition. As long as you're doing the same movements maybe every once a week, then you already are off to a really good start. And we don't want to space the repetition further and further apart from moving because if it's something like weightlifting, then you're going to need to do it multiple times a week. So it's kind of a given. You don't have to worry too much about this one if you're going to a consistent class or being consistent with the gym. And of course, you can always revise your notes before doing a movement again. The next one's a little bit different. Elaborate interrogation. Asking yourself why a certain skill or movement works or why a fact is true helps promote deeper understanding and memory. So for example, asking why and researching why it's a good idea to keep the spine neutral in a squat or deadlift can help you understand, be more motivated to do it and subsequently learn the form much quicker. Two more. Next up, we have using a mirror or visualization. Mirrors and recording myself helped me so much when I was learning my yoga form as well as weightlifting form. It helped to see where my body was in space. It helped to see if I was incorporating the yoga teacher's cue in an accurate way. Although it can be really confusing if you've misunderstood the cue and everybody's 
body looks different when doing these movements, but it is a huge advantage. Why do you think dancers have like the biggest mirrors when they're learning how to dance? And they have the best proprioception or body awareness. I believe seeing themselves in the mirrors every time they do their practice helps them understand so much quicker. Remember if you're fairly sedentary and are not used to moving your body in this new way, then it may take longer for you than others and that's completely okay. I'll do a video on proprioception in the future, so if that's something you're interested in learning, then feel free to subscribe. So running off of something Julia mentioned earlier, using concrete examples can also help our learning. Examples which feel easy to understand for abstract concepts can make the learning material more relatable and therefore much more easy to digest. So as mentioned earlier, we can learn quite officially by implementing the cues and really trying to understand them that are given to us by our coach or teacher. Next, to complement learning techniques we've just learned, I have a couple tips for you. First, this one's pretty simple, but get good nutrition and good sleep. Sleep is so important for learning. I was in a psychology lecture the other day and my lecturer said that sleep was even more important for learning than doing homework. If you get bad sleep, you don't feel like exercising, your brain feels more sluggish, impaired recovery, and also impaired memory consolidation, which happens while we sleep. We need to respect both the brain and body and hopefully we are less forgetful and less sloppy when actually learning the techniques since we're getting a good amount of sleep. Similar to sleep, good nutrition helps you maintain energy levels and feel more motivated to tackle your learning. On top of what Julia mentioned about not sitting still while learning, moving and increasing our blood flow can help us learn as well. So again, we kind of have a leg up, so to speak, when it comes to learning a movement activity because we're actually already moving. Next, try and notice your mistakes early. We don't want to learn the wrong muscle memory and have to unlearn it later. It's much harder to unlearn and then relearn again than learn a difficult thing from scratch with proper form, of course. Julia also mentioned that taking breaks and listening to your body can be much more productive than pushing through. She says, listen to your body and if you've told that you're going to take a break on a weekend, then adhere to that. Build that trust with yourself that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Normally when we learn a movement activity, it isn't for a very long chunk of time. Normally it's for like an hour at a time, but still, if you are repeating a very difficult movement over and over again, then maybe it's better to rest and prevent an injury. To facilitate the flow state and the enjoyment of learning, pick something that's just challenging enough. Not too easy and not too hard. That helps us stay in that present state, which is really fun to be in. Next, we're innately social creatures, so if you can learn with friends, then it's a really good idea to do so. I really like this about the jujitsu culture because you could message people just to drill randomly and they would show up and you can bounce off ideas and have multiple brains working on the same skills and problems. Finally, if it wasn't super obvious, hiring a coach can just speed through this process. I know it's not really a movement practice, but I recently got a cello teacher and my learning went like so much faster after investing in that. And it's been really beneficial just to kind of work on a problem with somebody else. Okay, so next up we have mindset. Okay, so first, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Trust that it will come with time and be patient. At least 99% of the time, the skill that you're trying to work on will come if you keep consistent at it. Your body needs time to understand, time to practice, time to sleep and consolidate the information. Your nervous system also needs time to learn the effort required and the coordination. Just keep at it and be gentle with yourself. Next, be willing to fail. Remember, failure is part of this and it's actually one of the best ways to learn something for good. So the next one, having a growth mindset was really important for me, but Julia now says that the data on a growth mindset is a little bit mixed. But personally thinking about skills and intellect as something which can change with effort and work helped me really stick and complete many of my goals. Some teachers also have a fixed mindset, so just be aware of that when you're learning. If a growth mindset is something that helps you, then having a teacher with a fixed mindset can really be quite frustrating. It's really important as well to understand that putting stress on the body in the form of exercise is actually good for us. It can often help you relax further once it's completed. 
It's a momentary stress that pushes us forward, but it's chronic stress, which is not super good for you. We mentioned this earlier, but it's important to keep an open mind. But I now mean that in the way that maybe your interests will change. Maybe your favorite kind of learning will change. Maybe with people and now it's self-study. Maybe the experience of a sport or the motivation towards a sport will change. It's worth keeping explorative and keeping that open mind. You should also keep your mind open because there are often multiple ways of doing or learning the same skill. And later on, you may end up breaking your own rules. Don't let yourself stick to a label. While I was doing yoga, I was kind of a yoga teacher and weightlifting was something which wasn't too often done as someone who's interested in yoga, but I was really interested in weightlifting. So eventually I kind of dropped the stigma, the persona of just a yoga teacher because I loved weightlifting so much and eventually began to weightlift and now I'm here helping other people do the same. Next, appreciate effort over results. This one's super important. Be more proud of yourself for showing up and putting that effort in and then the reward will come. This helps the learning in itself become rewarding. Finally, be mindful of your habits and what may be stopping you from becoming consistent. What would help you keep more accountable? This could be hiring a coach as this is a cheat code or it could just be messaging a friend to meet you at the gym. These next two stages are quite quick to go through, so let's get started. First, optimize and create a conductive learning space. Keep your space clean, keep your equipment all accessible, and make it easy just to pick up your dumbbells or your yoga mat or put your clothes out the night before. Next up, think about incorporating productive and enjoyable socialization into the environment. Again, choose a environment which facilitates learning for you specifically. So that could be meeting friends, a classroom, also just be an empty gym space. You also want to think about if the friends around you are supportive. Sometimes it's better to work out alone and just consume the media or just listen to your coach than it is to work out with friends who aren't super passionate about the same movement exercise. But on the other hand, it can be super powerful to be around supportive friends and people who are super into the activity just like you are. Next, you can also set kind of a reward into the environment. Truth is though, when we really enjoy exercise, it Again, the reward is the exercise itself. It's intrinsically motivating. So we've kind of come back full circle. If we see progress, then we're also more motivated to continue. If we don't think strongly about failure and keep consistent, then we prove to ourselves we can do difficult things. But that being said, adding a little bit of extrinsic reward here and there, not consistently because you don't wanna become reliant on an extrinsic reward that can actually take away some intrinsic motivation and make you more reliant on the extrinsic. But a good example of this could be maybe combining only your Friday training session with a visit to your favorite restaurant. Okay, my other mic cut out, so we'll sound a little different now. One final thing that Julia mentioned to me that stood out was if you're relying now on extrinsic motivation. So if you've started something, you really enjoyed it, but after a while you're starting to have to rely on extrinsic motivation over and over again, then maybe this is the phase where you need to reassess if this movement practice is right for you, or maybe go all the way back to the drawing board and figure out how you can reignite some passion for it. Just being mindful of how your learning is going and how your feelings are progressing towards your practice. Okay, finally, we have time. Set your practice to a time where you feel like your brain is on and ready to learn. You don't have to do all of these tips and many people struggle to find the perfect time to work out. In fact, there probably is no perfect time for everybody. Often things like work get in the way and when we do manage to work out, we aren't in the optimal mental state for learning. So just picking the time where you can be consistent with your practice will have much better effects. And finally, I'd actually choose working out with friends or going to a class over picking the perfect time. It does depend a little bit on the movement practice you've chosen, but generally working out with other people will really help motivate you more and even bring your brain into a learning state than if you just chose the perfect time, like if you're awake at lunch or in the morning, for example. So value class times or whenever you can over finding the perfect time. I don't know if it really exists, but if you do have the flexibility, it is something to keep in mind. Okay, stage four. Yes, that's four. <laughs> this is our final stage 
And this stage is all about repetition, practice, and continual study. So now you're set up to do this phase superficially, and this is kind of where the stages get a little bit more fluid. You can bounce between them. For example, you can fix your environment. You can go back and relearn a different type of deadlift and go through the steps again, explore different movements, and so on. This is like the phase of reassessing and just continual learning. It's all about finding what works best for you to keep you sticking to the these habits. If you're interested in learning about how to stick with your habits, I have another video on that, which I'll link somewhere around here. <laughs> okay, that's everything. <laughs> Come back to this video whenever you need a refresher or you feel like you're stagnating or you've begun a new movement practice. Additionally, I've also attached a PDF, which will give you more examples and help you work through these stages for your specific practice. So you can get that in the description. Also, if you want to know more about the mind to body connection or working out during the wintry months when it might be a little bit harder to work out, then subscribe. I'll have content on that out soon. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time. Also, if you're interested in the science, I've added the references in the description. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh Do something for the end screen. <laughs> Do a handstand. <laughs> Goodbye. See you next time. I can't. Okay. All right. That should be enough. There's enough time there. Click on the video if you're interested. <laughs>